Okay, so we wanted to uh, take inventory, if you will. You know, we had said that we were going to talk today about how to be the worst salesperson possible. How can we be the worst salesperson possible? And that was intended to jar you a little bit. That was intended for us to sit there and take inventory to see where we're at and where we want to go. To look at ourselves in the mirror real hard and say, are we doing the best possible job that we can be doing when we're out in the field and being able to teach our agents? So, you know, my wife, <clears throat> we, in our, in New Jersey, there's this thing called Peapod. Has anybody heard of Peapod? Is that around other areas in the nation? Boston, I guess. Um, <clears throat> Peapod is basically a, a, a really neat tool. You just go right online, you say what you want, and the food ends up at your house. You don't have to go to the supermarket. <coughs> Which is pretty nice, except for when you have to pay for it, you know? So my wife, she sits there, and she'll go online, and she'll go right into the sign into the thing, and it says, would you like me to fill out your order for you? The first time I ever saw this, I was like, this is kind of cool. You know, basically it looks at all the past history of all the different orders you've done and says, these are the things you've ordered before, and you're probably going to order them again. So you just click yes, and all of a sudden $87 is already charged to your checkout. And my wife, I guess, likes to do that, so she does that multiple times a week, and, and then I look at the credit card bill. But uh, I started to sit there and say, Faith, that's her name, look at what we had before you said yes. Look at what we have. Take inventory. See what you got here before you just hit yes, because you already have X, Y, and Z in the, the cupboard. You know, take inventory. So we wanted to do the same thing. We want to recognize that we have nothing here that we're offering in terms of new. We know that this is not new stuff. It's just taking the inventory of where we're at and where we can go. We know that as we look at the sales process specifically, we're just looking at. This is what we're doing, and this is how we can get better at it. So um, we're going to actually, I'm sorry, Dan, but we're going to Kahoot. We're going to go to Kahoot right now, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the inventory that we have. We're going to take some questions and ask some questions. We're going to put some money out there again in terms of what are the questions. These are about five different questions about our sales process, things that we already know. The number's coming up. Any second? Here we go. What are some questions, uh, these are about five questions that we're going to answer together about our sales and our career and our craft, specifically. Game pen is, remember it's kahoot.it and the pin is 508-418. So these questions are specifically in regards to our craft. And I call it a craft because it really is. You know, when you go into a, a doctor's office, you're going into a person's office that is a professional in their career. And we like to, and he's, he has a craft, or she has a craft. Well, we consider that a craft for ourselves. We've got 30 seconds players in, and oh, we're up to 38. <laughs> Anybody need to give it another minute, or should we go? Okay, let's go for it. Start now. So our first question, listen, you're going to get paid for these, so make sure you answer fast. As soon as it comes up, the more, the quicker you answer, the quicker you get a, uh, the more points you get. What was the median cost of a cremation with viewing in 2012? Was it A, $995? Was it B, $2,260, C, $3,250, or D, $5,410? Oh, 41s and 42. There are 42s, so that's it. Okay, with eight seconds left, everybody's answered. And the answer is 3250 We have 17 people. Now, these other numbers, congratulations to those of you who got it right, but these numbers specifically, notice they're, they're not fake numbers, the 995, anybody know what that number is? The I'm sorry? The lowest call for direct cremation. That's cremation, correct. Uh, direct cremation, <laughs> 2260, anybody know that one? Cremation without the viewing. Without the viewing. 3250 correct. is with the viewing, and 5410 is? I'm sorry? That was just there because I needed to throw another number there. <laughs> 
All right, so number two, let's keep it going. That's how things look so far. Mr. Glanton, number one. I wish I could say it. Oh, no, not Mr. Glanton. Do we have Scott right there. Excellent, good job. So he's in the lead. Number two. What was the median cost of a traditional burial with viewing in 2012? Was it A, 4,650, B, 7,045, C, 7,876, or D, 8,343? Right, it's D. 8,343. Congratulations to the 21 of you who, uh, who got it right. Obviously, um, A is not the answer. A is without, if, if it's just without a viewing, without a vault, nothing else, it's just straight up 4,650. 7,045. Anybody know that one? 7,045 is without a vault. Okay, so we know what a vault is, the 8 to 12 inch outer container that the casket goes inside, that's without a vault. 7,876 was just another number I threw in there, but D is the correct answer. Let's go to number three. Before we do, Scott is still in the lead, holding it tight there, 1917. And that's where the rest of the crew is. Which of the following is required to obtain a death certificate? Number A, father's place of birth. B, mother's maiden name. C, father's full name, or D, social security number. Which one is required in order to obtain a death certificate? A, B, C, or D? It's got 42 in, and the answer is all of them. So everyone won. What's the one thing that's missing? Does anybody know what the five things that are required? That it just so happens our final wishes book asks for it. five things that are absolutely required: father's been place of birth, father's full name, mother's maiden name, mother's place of birth, and social security number. Those are five things that need to be told uh, that are that are necessary in order for a place a death certificate to be required uh, obtained. I'm sorry. And Scott's still in the lead. C2C is getting close though. Next. What's the average cost of a casket? A. 1,095. B. 2,395. C. 2,795. D. 3,795. Average cost of a casket. We're in. Getting faster. Look at that. 13 seconds. Left. 2,395 is the answer, which is where the majority went. That's good stuff. So, the other numbers were just big numbers. Next. Oh, he took you out. <laughs> so who's C2C, our, our new leader? There you are. So uh, I think we have one more that are going to count towards the money, and then the last two are just going to be questions. I effectively communicate the emotional burden. So, oh, I'm sorry, this one doesn't count. You actually won. This is just for uh, a, uh, a survey here. I effectively communicate the emotional burden associated with one's passing 25% of the time, 50% of the time, 75% of the time, or 100% of the time. I effectively communicate the emotional burden. <clears throat> Would you say that you do it 25, 50, 75, or 100% of the time? Time's up, two people didn't get in, but we have 22 people who say that they do it 100% of the time. Six people that say three out of four presentations I do it. Nine people say that half the time I'm doing it, and 25% of the time for three of the people. All right, like I said, we're taking inventory. We're figuring out where we're at so that we can move forward. The next question is the real question while we're all here. It is, like the points don't matter at this point. My agents effectively communicate the emotional burden the answers are 25% of the time, 50% of the time, 75% of the time, or 100% of the time. My agents effectively communicate that emotional burden. Okay, 
Let's see what we got. Obviously, all answers were available, and the numbers were not so significant when it comes down to what our agents are doing, which is kind of what we expected. Six of the people said 25, 13 said 50, 75% was 11, and 10 were 100. So we recognize that maybe we might be doing what we need to do in order to effectively communicate the emotional burden, but maybe our agents aren't doing it. And with that, I'd like to kind of share with you one other circumstance about a supermarket. I was walking down the supermarket the other day, and on the aisle, I needed a, a, a thing of toothpaste. And I sat there, and I, look, I go up to the toothpaste aisle, and I said, all right, well, which one should I get? Let me go with Crest. So I grab Crest. And I say, Crest, cavity protection, the regular paste. That's got to be the one that I need, right? I mean, oh, well, hold up, wait a minute. Crest baking soda and peroxide whitening. Oh, this is a tough one. I got the regular paste or I got the baking soda with whitening paste. Which one am I going to do? Oh, maybe I can answer this by making things a little more difficult. Crest complete, multi benefit, extra white. That's where it's at. Extra whitening. That's the one I've got to go with. Oh, but this one's on sale. Got to look at this one, Crest Tartar Protection Whitening. Oh, cool mint paste. That one's going to make my mouth fresh. It's got the ADA symbol and everything. That's where I got to go. Oh, but this one, look at this one. It's got a cool box, hologram and all that. 3D Crest Whitening. Brilliance. That's where it's at. I got to choose this one instead. No, but if I do that, then I won't be able to get the Crest complete. It's got the whitening, that's even small now, that's not as impressive, but it also has a deep clean. Yeah, multi-benefit complete. Maybe if I go with that one, I'll be uh, the best teeth around. But look at Crest, they won't give up on this. They got a new option for me. Look at this, I can have a deep, cool mint flavor, or I can have a complete multi-benefit with some cinnamon in it. Some nice cinnamon. <laughs> that's where it's at, right there, cinnamon. Oh, but if I do that one, then I won't get 45% more. <laughs> if I choose the other one, I gotta, I gotta go with the 45% more because, you know, it's new and improved. I start there because we understand, like we said, we know the sales process. All of us are professionals. We just got a bunch of huge tech checks handed out to the room because we know how to sell, right? But we're gonna talk about how we can further the sales process the same way Crest has. These guys came out with this stuff in 1950. They led a movement to basically say, hey guys, you gotta brush your teeth twice a day. That was, that was Crest that did this, right? They were the ones that said, we're gonna, we're gonna go to the government, we're gonna figure this out. And then every single day since then, they've been teaching us new ways. Guys, this is not the whole sales, like, this, this is not the whole aisle when you're in the supermarket of Crest. They're over 15. I just, Stopped at 25 bucks and said I can't spend any more on toothpaste. This doesn't make sense. But this is ridiculous. They said, look, we're going to be the top of, the, of our game. We're going to sit there. We're going to have a regular place. We're going to go there. Yeah. But we're going to just keep going. And every single time, our clients are going to know that we got the best of the best. We're always going to be new and improved. They, they know that if there's going to be a new ingredient that's out there that'll get teeth whiter, get teeth cleaner, then they know they can trust in Crest. They got... I mean, after I started looking at this, I was like, man, these guys know what they're doing. Sorry. They know what they're doing. I'm going to stop that because that's just going to keep falling. But they know where they're going with this. They're not giving up. And they won't give up. They know that as long as we're a customer, as long as we can trust that they're going to do whatever's best for them, they'll keep investing. And yeah, you know what? Every time they invest, that new box might cost more money. That new box might be painful for them to get to, but they're gonna figure it out. And I invite each of us to really look at it right now from a new and improved perspective for our sales presentation. We recognize that we might be effectively communicating the presentation in regards to our emotions, uh, the emotional burden 100% of the time, but we also recognize that we might not be doing a great job of sharing that with our agents. And recently, over the last year, we've spent a great deal on focusing on how to do that. Um, you know, we in the Northeast, it's a different beast. 
And I, I think we can understand that there's a lot of things that are different, but maybe not so much across the nation, right? We recognize that we can't sell insurance in New Jersey. We don't, we, when we came down here the first time, we saw, heard somebody say insurance. We were like, what, what are they talking about? Are they speaking a different language? <laughs> right? We weren't quite sure what was going on there. You know, we don't sell insurance. In our presentation, we don't say it. We just don't do it. Why? Because people don't want to buy insurance in New Jersey. For some reason. So for us, maybe that's different from you guys, but for us, that's where we're at. We have to meet them where they're at. In New Jersey, like Scott said, we're a little rude. So we meet people being rude. You know, we, we, we recognize it when we talk to our agents. We remind them that, listen, when you want to go get your driver's license, you got to go down to the DMV. When you sit in front of the DMV, that lady is the nastiest possible person you've ever spoken to. And then when you go to the bank, you're talking to the nastiest possible person you're speaking to. Why? Because they're government officials in many regards. They have something to kind of lord over every person they meet with. So we teach our agents to kind of go in from that perspective. Why? Because they are official that way. So we recognize that we need to be a little different. We recognize that we need to be advocates. Those people are advocates in many regards. So I was standing there going to get my passport for my, my son the other day, went into the bank, the woman says, I am a federal employee because I know every single area, or I'm a federal employee who knows every single facet of the passport application process. Do not question me. I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, I apologize. You're the advocate in this regard, I understand. And I backed right off because I had to question her as to why I need to go get my wife and bring her, but it was a mess. But the fact is, she was the advocate. And we in the Northeast, we recognize we have to kind of do things a little different. It might be the same throughout the nation. That's what we're talking about today. Can we be better at what we do? We have to ask ourselves. Our advocates are always going to be organized. That means that they're always going to go into the house without a briefcase. That's, if I'm an advocate, I don't go in the house with a briefcase. Why? Because I have one product that I'm focused on. Right? We don't go in there with multiple products. We're organized in that regard. We teach our agents that if you're going to go out there, you're going to sit down, and you say you're going to have 12 sales this week, then sit down, make 12 packets. That packet has all of the tools that you're going to need when you're in that house. Every single thing. Waste the paper. Make them. Prepare. You're organized. You go in the house with that briefcase, all of a sudden you become an insurance salesman, and the average for an insurance salesman, according to Limra, that they make on, a, on an annual basis is $28,000. Who here wants to be an insurance salesman? <laughs> right? I want to leave that behind. I want to go in there as an advocate, a specialist, a pro at my craft. We control the sales setting. That comes across in the approach that we take, comes across in the way that we handle it. Like we said, we're not talking to, in terms of anything is new here. We're just reminding ourselves, right? We're new and improved. We're trying to get better and better and better. So when we say we're going to control the sales setting, we're going to go in there and ask questions and more and more and more. We're not going to be used car salesmen, if you will. We master our craft. We become relevant to our prospect. How do we do that? We become new and improved constantly. Always new information, constantly researching, constantly asking for new ways to be able to do this, constantly being able to put more information in front of that person that will make me more relevant to what they need. And we constantly, at the end of the day, we fill a need. Right? We're filling a need, we're not creating a need. We're going into a house, finding out what the person wants, and then providing it to them. We never say these two bad words. Never, as advocates. Anybody know what those two words are? Life insurance is probably the other two bad words. I shouldn't put that in there, but the words that I'm looking for are thank you. We teach our guy, I know, and that sounds strange, but just an approach that we've been taking in the Northeast. We don't say thank you. If I say thank you to a client, I'm saying thank you so much for feeding my family. Thank you so much for being able to put gas in my car. Thank you so much for... Putting me over the top so I can make that 300 bucks in the March Madness contest. Thank you. You just made me number one. Thank you. Versus letting, making it so that everything we do sets them up to say thank you to us. And when we're setting up appointments, 
we have we do our presentation. I mean, our, our, our Monday morning sales appointments together in the same room, right? We get out there. You hear our guys talking. If somebody says thank you, another agent's walking over and says, "What's wrong with you? Are you crazy? You don't need this. You, you know, she, that person's no way that person's going to show up. You just said thank you. She knows you're going to come to close them now. Whereas when you set it up, you'll hear in our presentations on Monday on our, on our appointment setting, you'll hear, "What are you talking about?" You, you put your name, your date of birth, your phone number on that lead. You're the one that did that. You said that back to me. How dare you hang up on me? What kind of crazy person puts all that information on the card and then doesn't even want the person to come deliver it? You know? So we kind of we, we, we present ourselves differently as advocates. We're going out to deliver that information, and we're not thanking you for it. You're going to be thanking me for that. I did, my, I did what I had to do to deliver that information. We never deviate from our process as advocates, right? Salespeople, we kind of move all over the place. What, what do you want to buy to, for me today? I got annuities here. I got long-term care here. I have whole term life, you know, whole life insurance here. I got term life insurance. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Whereas farm expense specialists, we never deviate. We stay on a process and we don't change. We provide the need. We never appear to be selling in that way. We're always advocating on their behalf because we're doing what's best for them. And I know it sounds harsh the way I'm presenting it, but at the end of the day, we truly believe that this person does not want to face their mortality. This person would like to ignore their mortality in every shape, every way, shape, or form that they can. So if we can figure out ways to overcome that, to get them to face the fact that, yes, we are going to die, and yes, when I die, I will leave a burden on someone, that's how we do it. And finally, because of that, we never have challenges recruiting. When we ask questions like, what do you do for a living? And we're able to say, I alleviate emotional and financial burdens for loved ones. And we do things that pretty much avoid saying, I'm an insurance salesman. All of a sudden, I'm able to get more information. I'm able to share a little bit more about the process. I'm able to be a little bit more um, important to the person that I'm speaking to. So it's for that reason that uh, we feel that advocating is the best. And... Um, we're always asking ourselves these specific questions. It's a good thing those crests fell down because if they didn't, have to get another step for Scott when he gets over. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go back and forth all day, aren't we? <laughs> okay, so when you get into a car after doing a presentation, and whether you got a sale or you didn't get a sale, and you sit down and you say, what, let me examine what just happened in that presentation. What do you think one of the most important questions you can ask yourself about how that presentation went is? When you get in the car, what do you, what do you say to yourself? What could I have done differently? Okay. Did I meet the need of the client? Did I meet the need of the client? Okay. I'm going to work right off of did I meet the need of the client and just reword the question. How many people can leave a house and absolutely positively know every single time why those people sent the card in? Nobody. Do you ever stop and ask yourself, why did I send why did they send the card in? For a free Walmart gift card. For a free Walmart gift card. Well, in that case, then somebody's making a sale in the house and it may not necessarily be you. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, what, what I realize all the time is that they've been thinking about life insurance forever. The war my car was the trigger for them to send it. Okay. But at the end of the day, they're still in life insurance. And that's what I find out, you know, obviously, a couple of years I've been doing this. Okay, so let me ask you a question. If you were to sit down with someone, you establish a rapport, you're sitting at the kitchen table, you control the sales setting, and you say, this is Jones, this is the card you sent in. Why wasn't you sent it in? And they said, because I needed some life insurance. Do you know why you're there? Uh, to me, I just go right into the product, explain how it works. And um, they're already sold. I just... Really? To me, uh, when they say that, I'm 
base, this is just me, I don't know your, your agents. Mm -hmm. But me, most of the time when they say life insurance, I go right into the product, explain obviously either depending on the situation where they are. Cause I, I do my pre-screening first, you know, have you this, 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 that, 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 and I kind of know exactly where to put them, you know. Right. And when they say life insurance, because I ask that question, I put the car in their hands because I want them on board. I say, Mr. Smith, when you send this out, you know, um, can you please explain to me what, what do you have in mind? And they say life insurance. I'm not trying to oversell it. They already sold. Really? Okay. Seriously. And I just go into, I mean, every, every, every area is different. And in my case, I just present the product, you know, whether it's, you know, American Epico or Forsters, whatever the situation okay. is. And then um, I just take it from there. Most of the time when they say me that, I, they'll buy it. I have a question. How many people in the room agree that when you walk in the house that they say, I want to buy some life insurance, you just pull the product out? Nobody agrees? Okay, how come? Somebody speak up, how come? You don't know why they buy it. What? Why are you buying it? Why? 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 Yeah. You need a why. You have to know why. Listen, these people filled out this card, sent this card in. You had to go through 40, 50 of these cards to get some appointments. You had to put gas in your car, get in the car, drive to their house, organize your schedule, be ready. You spent a lot of time and money to get into that house. You have a right to know why they sent that card in. It is your right. You deserve to be sitting at that table. And don't think any less of yourself to think that you don't have a right to be sitting at that table. Just quickly. When we present, you say people send it in. Why, why did you send the card in? We give them three options. The three options we give them are to relieve the emotional burden associated with your passing, to relieve the financial burden associated with your passing, or to alleviate both. Now, there is a script, and, and for time purposes, we won't go into the script, and if somebody wants to populate it, you know what, I am going to read through it. The people we've been able to help the most have been able to send, send this card in for one of three reasons. The first, because they recognize the emotional burden they will one day leave upon their loved ones. For most people, the day their parent dies is the hardest day of their life, not to be surpassed by the day after when they're sitting in the funeral home, forced to make tons of very difficult decisions in the midst of their tremendous grief. Someone who sends this card to alleviate the emotional burden is looking to spare their loved ones from this grief. The second reason is the financial burden that will be associated with their passing. As you know, all these decisions will require funding, and as the card we mail states, no one will be there to help us with that. In fact, Social Security, if you qualify, only pays two fifty-five dollars towards burial expenses. That's like putting a band-aid on an open-heart surgery incision. Your son or daughter, Mary, will be forced to either pass the hat, place this burden on a credit card, and remember you plus interest every month, or possibly take from your grandchildren's college savings account. None of these are dignified, and some send this card in to alleviate the huge financial burden they'll be leaving on their loved ones. The final category are those people who realize they will leave be leaving both an emotional and a financial burden on their loved ones. Of these three categories, which is the reason you sent the card in? Now, yes, you're going to get the people that say I sent it in for Walmart. Right. But you're not going to stop there. You need to find out, is it emotional, is it financial, or is it both? And when you get the answer, I sent the card in because I just wanted some more information. That's fantastic. About what? Why? Why, 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 why? If you make a presentation, without knowing why people sent the card in, you are absolutely, positively wasting your time. When somebody calls you from the field and says, yeah, I just left this guy's house, but I just couldn't close him, you shouldn't be asking a gazillion questions before saying, well, let me ask you a question, Joe. Why did he send the card in? And you're gonna find over and over again that they don't know. How can they create a need if they don't know what was on the person's mind when they sent the card in? Okay. Okay. No, no, not yet. Um, I want to. I want to just tell kind of a quick, quick personal story. Um, when I was in college, I was selling final expense, and um, it was kind of rough for me. It was sort of paying the bills a little bit, put me through college, but. I never quite, I didn't get it. It wasn't clicking for me. And this was in 1996. I had an appointment with a lady in Patterson, New Jersey. And when I called her, she insisted 
that I come at 7.30 in the morning. Now, I'm in college, 7.30 in the morning, I didn't know anybody did anything at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> but I did. I pulled up to this big Victorian house in Patterson, New Jersey, which is not, not a very nice area. Old house. Pouring rain, of course, just a drama to the story, but it really was happening. Went to the house, knocked on the door. She wasn't answering. I did have one of those big Motorola cell phones at the time. She wasn't answering. I called her. I said, Mrs. Jones, this is Anthony Rose. I'm here for our appointment. And her response to me was, it's too damn early. Wow. <laughs> to which I responded, Mrs. Jones, you requested that I come here this early. I am at your front door. Please come open the door now. She came to the front door, and she opened the door, and she did one of those, and just kind of walked, walked away, which I assumed meant I can come in the house. And I walked into the house, huge living room in this, this, this big Victorian, and, and I'm not exaggerating, she sat on the couch and told me to sit on the couch probably as far as Scotty and I are away from each other. To which I did. <clears throat> And I sat down and I said, Mrs. Jones, we used, we used a different three reasons. At, at that time it was, whatever, people send this card in either because they don't have any coverage, they have very little coverage or they're losing their group coverage, is what we used to say. Said that and she said, how much is it? So well, I'm trying to find out what it is that you need. She said, don't worry about any of that. How much is it? And I kept trying and I kept trying and I kept pushing and I was not a happy camper. And finally, I took my book and I slammed it shut and I said, I'm very sorry, I can't help you. And I started walking towards the door. She said, no, no, don't do that. The exact words never forget. I said, I'm sorry, I'm trying to help you, but if you don't tell me what it is you need, I don't know how I can help you and I don't even know if you're going to qualify. And her response was, my grandson was incarcerated last night. I've been up all night. Please let me get a cup of coffee and then we'll sit down and we'll talk. Okay, that'll work. Let's go into the kitchen and do that. And it ended up being one of the biggest sales I ever had. And this is back in 1996. I still remember it to the day, and it clicked for me. It suddenly clicked. If you don't know why you're there, you're wasting your time. Find out why people mail this card in. Is Bill Cole here? He is not. All right, well. Um, even though Bill isn't, isn't here, I still just want to, we, we do leads, obviously some things have changed. We do leads, um, pay for some people, some people use, use electronics only. And I just, this came across my desk and I just, I couldn't let it go. I figured we had to absolutely positively show this in the summit. Because those of you, how many people were at the last leadership summit? Okay, a good, good amount of you. Um, Bill Cole got up at the last summit and said, every time a lead is printed, a little part of me dies. Everyone remember that? Yes, no? Okay. What Bill didn't know is that somebody put a camera in his house. And this was the video that came out to show the different ways of a little bit of him dying every time paper. so that our agents are able to really express the emotional burden that's associated with the passing of a loved one. And 
we paid a few hundred thousand dollars, or much more than we really wanted to spend. At the end of the day, everyone kind of cringes when we even think about this. But this, we had an outside research firm ask thousands and thousands of seniors, what keeps you up at night? And this was the results. This is what we call the seven challenges threatening the dignity of seniors. <clears throat> What we thought was, if we can ask people and show ourselves that we are, or show them that we're truly advocating on their behalf, when we go into the home, we're no longer creating a need. We're no longer sitting down and saying, hey, how do I do this? How do, you know, can I help you? Can I help you? Instead, we're able to say, Mrs. Jones, we have diversified, went out and asked thousands of seniors what matters most to them. And their results were staggering. They came back to us with seven things that were shared Overall, Now, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to go through these lists with you very quickly, but I want you to know, at the end of the day, you're not alone. The first concern that these seniors were, were staying up at night was because of financial hardship. They were asking themselves, how will I make ends meet? The second, they were saying, well, I'm afraid of fraudulent activity. Can I trust anyone? Third was health risks. How do I stay healthy? Fourth, what will I do with him or her if he passes away, right? The loss of a spouse. What's going to happen when he's gone or she's gone? Fifth was the loss of independence. Will I even be able to drive still? Sixth was what emotional decisions must be made in the event of my, my husband's passing or my passing or my wife's passing? And seventh was how will I financially pay for all of this? Mrs. Jones, you're not alone. These concerns that you are concerned about, the reason why you sent this card back to us, the reason why I'm delivering this information to you right now, is shared by these other thousands of people. Now, I'm not going to be able to help you with all these things, Mrs. Jones, and I apologize for that. But let me see if we can help you with this last six and seven, of which you, you said you want to alleviate both the emotional and financial burden. What we found in the results of this this pamphlet that we put, that put out that cost us way too much money is that agents were able to go in there not as agents any longer. Now they're advocates. Now when they sit down, they truly are an advocate seeking to help a person instead of just sitting back. Seeking to go and, and truly be a, a, an aid to them instead of selling them. And this was coupled with the next step that Anthony's going to speak to. How many people are using the Final Wishes Guide right now? I'm sorry, keep your hands up once again. Wow, that's the okay. Um, oh, the first thing you have to do is get your client's attention. Wearing a tie like that is absolutely not the way to do it. <laughs> I guess it depends, you have to know your audience. So, a lot less people are using, using this than, than I thought. The most emotional part of our presentation, the most emotional part is this. When we get to this part right here, we are setting the stage that the financial part, and today we're not even gonna discuss the financial part. We're only gonna show you how we feel the emotional need. But the most emotional part is established right here. You will get more facts than you can imagine, and it should be teed up for you like you can't believe, utilizing this. So, when you get to this, you have two questions. Number one, have you ever had the unfortunate experience of arranging a funeral? If they say yes, where do you go? What do you do if they say yes? How much did it cost? I'm sorry? How much did it cost? How much did it cost? What else? Who died? Where? How long ago? How'd that make you feel? Do you remember? Do you remember? Were you prepared? Bottom line is all of you just threw out questions. And that's what it is. It's questions. Ask as many questions as you could. You have to say, if you had died yesterday, Mrs. Jones, who would be running around today like a chicken with their head cut off trying to figure out your arrangements? Who would be doing it? Oh, your daughter Mary? Mrs. Jones, I have to ask you a question. You told me that your husband passed away and it was three years ago. When your husband passed away, did you know what he wanted? <clears throat> Do you remember, Mrs. Jones, when you walked down to the funeral home on one of the most emotional days of your life 
and you sat down with that funeral director, and that funeral director probably asked you 150 questions. Do you remember this? And sometimes they'll say yeah, sometimes they'll say no. And when they say no, you just erupt. Of course you don't remember. It was one of the most emotional days of your life. And then you have to say, which funeral home was it that you used? You used Smith and West, Smith and Weston Funeral Hall? <laughs> Did you like the services that they gave you? Is that a funeral home you'd like to use? It is. I have another question for you. Does your territory here know that? And just pause and wait. Sometimes I'll say yes, sometimes I'll say no. And then you have to continue to delve into more questions. And after every question, you have to go into, does Mary know that? Sooner or later, they're gonna realize that they truly do have an emotional problem, an emotional need and a problem there. Because Mary does not know everything that she thinks Mary knows. You have to then, you have to go into the fact that if they did not, let me just step back one second, if they have not had the unfortunate experience of going into a funeral home and arranging a funeral home, you need to paint the picture, and I'm gonna try to do it very quickly for you. You need to paint the picture of, well, let me just explain to you what's gonna happen, Mrs. Jones. On one of the most emotional days of your life, of, of your daughter Mary's life, after you pass, she's going to have to get herself together She's going to have to go down to the funeral home. She's going to have to sit down with the funeral home director. And she is going to be asked an ungodly amount of questions. Things you never even thought of. Things like, does mom want to have her glasses on when she gets buried? What does mom want to wear? Things you could have never, ever, ever imagined. And she's going to be sitting there. And she's going to answer all these questions. But there's two questions that will never be answered, Mrs. Jones. Mary is gonna be sitting there saying after each question, what would mom have wanted? Over and over, would mom have wanted this? Would mom have wanted that? And then after going through this grueling couple of hours, she's gonna walk out of the funeral home. She's gonna walk down a couple of steps. She's gonna say, did I make the right decisions? And unfortunately, Mrs. Jones, Mary does not know those answers. She's never gonna know those answers. This is the scenario that you paint so that they understand this is a very emotional time. You're gonna go through this Final Wishes book. Those of you who are not utilizing it, we don't have the time to go through this right now, but there are some things in here. You, you have to paint, point out the things that are needed for a death certificate. You have got to point out the fact that they can write down any insurance policies that they might have. Do your fact finding here. You could, you, could, you could put in here, do you have any debilitating health conditions that your children or your grandchildren may need to know about later on in life when they're answering medical questions? Mrs. Jones, you can put your check in your savings account here. Who do you bank with, by the way? I bank with PNC Bank. That's great, we work with them. You can put your check in or your savings account information here. Do some fact finding over and over and over again. This thing is absolutely amazing. You've got to use this as often as you possibly could. It's absolutely amazing. One other little tidbit. I want you to tell Mrs. Jones, after she is done filling this out, she realized that it takes a lot of time to fill it out, fill out two pages a day, that you want her to take this along with your business card and any other pertinent paperwork that you give her. You want her to put this in a Ziploc freezer bag. You want her to take this and put this in her freezer. And then you want her to call Mary and tell Mary that everything that she wants when something happens to her is in her freezer. Why do we do that? What's, what's that? Case of fire. Number one. Number two. 
Mary's never going to forget that it's in the freezer. Instead of all those boxes under the bed, she's never going to forget that it's in the freezer. Number three, if they ever have to call you because they want some more coverage, they're going to know exactly where to go because they're going to look at it every time they open the freezer up. Refrigerator is one of the first things that gets cleared out when someone passes away. But one of the most important reasons is that when you call Mary back to try to get a referral, I'm sorry, Mrs. Jones back to try to get a referral or to try to add some more coverage, and you say, I'm the crazy guy or I'm the crazy guy that told you to put that book in your freezer, they're going to remember you. They're absolutely going to remember you. Um, again, we can't do everything on this, but that, that, that's where we're at there. So, you know, honestly, what we're trying to do throughout the whole process is become an advocate. We really believe that we are able to recruit in a different way and manage in a different way because we're filling a need in a different way. No longer are we just the insurance guys. Now we're truly specialists helping other people go through the hardest time of their life. And by taking care of both the emotional and the financial burden as one, we separate ourselves and, and, and are able to help people and be remembered in a certain way. So we'd like to end with a specific video that, and honestly, it helps us focus on what we want to do and the impact that we want to leave and the influence we want to leave on our agents. I've often said that I wish people could realize all their dreams and wealth and fame and so that they could see that it's not where you're going to find your sense of confusion. I can tell At the end of the day, look, we know we are speaking to the best agents in the nation. We know that you know the sales process better than anybody. But when it comes down to it, if we want to get better, if we want to stay on the top, if we want to continue to own this industry, then we got to be like Crest. We got to constantly be new and improved. And hopefully the things that we shared with you today have put us all on the track to be able to make that happen.